hello, hello. And welcome to Art Matters. Uh, and it does, right? It does. I noticed the other day that I think many institutions have stolen the title of this lecture series. I'm not sure that it's very original, I'm convinced. Uh, I don't think I'm the first one to think of it. But uh, in any case, I wanted to rebrand the lecture series a little bit when I started to manage it. So it, it sort of changed its title, because it used to be Art Talks. And now it's Art Matters. But uh, my name's Ike Kong, and I'm the deputy director and chief curator here at the museum. And um, this series has really been a pleasure for me because I get to think and talk to so many different scholars and old friends who come and, and visit and share their recent work. And uh, this case is no different. And uh, we're really very privileged to be able to be one of the first audiences to enjoy uh, this lecture by Annie Bournoff, uh, who comes to us all the way from Chicago. So, uh, well, one thing I just wanted to ask out of curiosity, how many of you are repeat offenders in attending this lecture series? <laughs> OK, I'd just like us taking a straw poll, because Catherine, my assistant who helps to organize the series with me, uh, we were thinking of maybe doing a seasonal subscription and maybe doing a little discount for people who attend on a regular basis. Uh, it's always nice to have some kind of anticipated notion of the income for a series like this, too. Um, this year, I should mention that the women's board uh, underwrote the whole series, so uh, we're less concerned about the bottom line for a change. But uh, yeah, no, it's great to have your faithful attendance, and hopefully you'll enjoy this lecture as much as we did uh, last month. So I should mention as well that next month will be a lecture by a very prominent uh, paintings conservator who used to be the chief conservator at the Kimball Art Museum, uh, Claire Berry, will be coming to speak to us about Murillo and Zurbaran, um, so 17th century Spanish painting, which is a whole other thing. Uh, but we can look forward to that as well. But let me tell you about Annie. Annie teaches modern art at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago in the Department of Art History, Theory, and Criticism. She specializes in European modernism and has written two books related to the art of Paul Clay, the second of which is the basis for her talk today. Her first book, published by the University of Chicago Press, is called Paul Clay, The Visible and the Legible. And it was awarded the prestigious Robert Motherwell Book Award in 2016. Her second book, which is the book she's going to talk about uh, with us today, has the intriguing title of Behind the Angel of History, the Angulus Novus, and its interleaf. I believe we have several copies available, in fact, uh, for a book signing that she has very uh, kindly agreed to. So if you are wanting to have your own personally inscribed copy, you can uh, follow her to the table outside the doors here. Uh, most recently, Annie's been working on an essay for the exhibition catalog associated with the show focused on the work of Lucia Moholy. And you'll remember that we had Jan Tiki in October to talk about that show, which potentially will still uh, be coming to us at some point in the future. Um, we're still hoping to host that exhibition, and that, of course, if all goes well. So then maybe we can have Annie back to talk about uh, that subject as well. But in any case, I'm so thrilled that we are going to be able to enjoy this lecture. So help me welcome Annie to the stage. Thank you so much, Ike. And thank you so much to the um, Women's Board um, for, for having me here. It's a real honor and a pleasure. And um, I wanted to let you all know that since it's like not a huge audience, I think that we can be a little bit more casual about questions. If something comes up, like don't you can like raise your hand, and we can get to it as as we go along, um, rather than saving everything to the end, because I know things evaporate that way. Um, all right, so I'm yeah, I'm thrilled to be here and be able to tell you about 
my new book and the here it is and the unlikely series of events that led to it. It's a, it's a short book uh, from the University of Chicago Press, and it's really, it's ridiculously focused. It's all about one work of art by Paul Klee, the Swiss German modernist artist um, that he made in 1920. But it involves, as it turns out, quite a lot of um, his and others' reflections on art history, the history of art history, Jewish-Christian relations in Weimar Republic Germany, and a good stretch of 20th century European intellectual history. Am I audible? Yes. Yeah. Excellent. So, here it is. Um, it's called Angelus Novus, or New Angel. And it's a watercolor drawing. It's about that big. And it's become arguably Clay's most famous work. Certainly one of the most famous. You can get it. There are multiple people with tattoos of it. You get these leggings. <laughs> um, but but it's, it's gotten famous in kind of a roundabout, strange way. Um, it's famous really because it was the most important possession of the German Jewish literary critic, Walter Benjamin, who long after his 1940 death, became one of the most widely cited thinkers of the 20th century, and who referred to the picture in some of his most important writings. Above all, this picture became famous in connection with the passage in Benjamin's Marxist theological theses on the concept of history, written in 1940. Here's the passage, and I'm going to read it in full. There is a picture by Clay called Angelus Novus. It shows an angel who seems about to move away from something he stares at. His eyes are wide, his mouth is open, his wings are spread. This is how the angel of history must look. His face is turned toward the past. Where a chain of events appears before us, he sees one single catastrophe, which keeps piling wreckage upon wreckage and hurls it at his feet. The angel would like to stay, awaken the dead, and make whole what has been smashed. But a storm is blowing from paradise and has got caught in his wings. It is so strong that the angel can no longer close them. This storm drives him irresistibly into the future to which his back is turned, while the pile of debris before him grows toward the sky. What we call progress is this storm." End quote. So it's in conjunction with this passage that the picture became famous in the surge of interest in Benjamin beginning around the West German student movement in the 1960s. In a post-war, post-Shoah world, neither Benjamin nor Clay knew. Clay's work picture became an icon of the left in one art historian's rather biting words. Uh, the art historian said, a dozen lines of printed text conveniently focused on one picture suitable for incessant reproduction have become a venue for drawing out a string of fundamental contradictions between revolution and religion, activism and resignation, political partisanship, and historical detachment. So the project that became this book began in 2015 when I got an email from the contemporary American artist R.H. Quaitman. Maybe some of you saw her exhibition in LA in, in 2016. 
Quaitman's paintings are built atop photo-based silk screens derived from intensive research about the places where she exhibits. So she told me in her email that she was working on an upcoming exhibition in Tel Aviv that would be in part about the Angelus Novus. She wrote, ordinarily, I wouldn't gravitate towards such an iconic image, but I was given the opportunity to examine it closely in Jerusalem. I noticed it is glued to an old engraving, and I wondered what the engraving was exactly. To make a very long and complicated story short, I have been trying unsuccessfully to figure it out with the help of the Paper Conservation Department and the director of the Israel Museum. So that was the email. Although I'd written a book on clay in which Benjamin's, here it is, in which Benjamin's writings on the artist actually play a big role, and I think that that's why she emailed me, I'd actually kept my distance from the Angelus too. I didn't think it an especially interesting work. I didn't think Benjamin's writings really had that much to do with the picture. The whole topic just seemed totally overworked. But I'd never heard anything about this old engraving that Quaitman mentioned, whose edge was plainly visible all the way around in the photographs she sent. And if you've got your handout, there may still be some more in the back. You might be able to see that better than on the screen. I'm not quite sure. So I, you know, it was very strange. At first, I felt quite embarrassed not to know about this, because I'm supposed to be a clay expert. But then I was looking around, and I found that no one had actually ever mentioned it. This was a strange mystery, not just unsolved, but somehow overlooked in plain sight. So I joined in her quest. Now, the margin that the Angelus revealed was full of clues. And maybe you can see this better in your handout. Um, so you can see there's a 1520-something date, one, five, bottom of a two. There's an LC, or maybe it's a CL monogram. There's um, dark robes. You can see the outline here that made Quaitman suspect it was a portrait of a minister or a nun, something like that. So going on those clues, plus untold, frankly, obsessive hours of sifting through digitized print collections and luck, Quaitman found it. She found the needle in the haystack. And she discovered that the mystery image was, of all things, a portrait of Martin Luther. So this is actually another impression of the same print that Clay used. If you compare the details, there's really no doubt about it. It's a very ordinary print made in 1838 by a little-known engraver. It's the kind of thing that might have hung in any Protestant home in 19th century Germany. It announces itself as reproducing a 1521 painting by Lucas Cranach. So Quaitman's discovery had suddenly made visible the fact that Clay's famous work was a collage featuring, albeit unobtrusively, the initiator of the Protestant Reformation. What on earth to make of this strange occurrence? <laughs> Quaitman made a new group of paintings about it, uh, which were exhibited in New York and at Documenta. And I had a new research question. Why had Clay pasted his picture on top of this old Luther engraving, leaving revealed this teasing margin? And that's what I'm going to try to answer today. 
It's one chapter of the book. So in an essay on her discovery, Quaitman expresses regret. She wrote, my curiosity took over, and the obvious was forgotten, that Clay didn't intend us to know who lay behind. That alone should have stopped me. If the Angelus defaces Luther, am I defacing the Angelus? The meaning of an artwork cannot by its very nature be hidden from view. How can I morally situate this exposure? If Clay wanted us to know who lurks behind the angel, he wouldn't have covered up so much of the engraving. But the amount he reveals suggests that he did want people to wonder. It's a kind of picture puzzle. And I think in Germany, circa 1920, the fine minds that Clay said he saw as his public might have enjoyed putting together Clay's clues to guess that this was a print of one of Cronach's many Luther portraits. Unlike Quaitman, they wouldn't be able to say which particular one, and they couldn't be sure they were right. But the monogram and date would suggest the famous German Renaissance master Lucas Cronach, the dark robe, a sober churchman, and the angel's own jowls and curls echo features um, that were often emphasized in Cronach's portraits of Luther. You have to understand that these prints after Cronach had a huge circulation. Now, during the 16th century Reformation, the large workshop run by Luther's friend Cronach turned out enormous numbers of Luther portraits. They were a major component of the Reformation's media strategy. And to some extent, this circulation continues. Every Lutheran church and home needs a print of Martin Luther. Just how widespread they were in the early 20th century is suggested by a Nazi decree in 1936 ordering schools and public buildings to remove them. While, as Quaitman says, Clay didn't intend us to know who lay behind, I think he would expect us to guess. Now, it might be tempting to see the hidden reformer as somehow the picture's truth, say, as a confession of faith. But it doesn't seem Clay had any strong feelings about Luther. He does not present his own unbelief and criticism of Christianity as hard won. His Protestant family did not emphasize religion. The few times Clay mentions Luther in his letters, he's a figure of cultural history. In 1902, Clay did admire Cronach's portrait of Luther in the Uffizi. In 1906, he praises Rabelais and calls him, quote, reform-minded but going far beyond stupid Luther end quote. Or it may be tempting to see Luther as the picture's truth in some more iconoclastic sense, as when Quaitman wonders whether she is defacing the Angelus. In the late 20th century, the Angelus became an icon of the left. Under, as it were, Benjamin's famous 1940 thesis on the angel of history, beneath Clay's drawn angel, we find this hero image of German nationalism. As Quaitman says, Muller makes Luther a, quote, Teutonic alpha male, a triumphant warrior of his beliefs, end quote. Luther wrote the treatise on the Jews and their lies. From the perspective of 1940, the Nazi use of Luther is unavoidable. In 1920, when Clay sandwiched Luther into his work, the reformer was often seen as personifying authoritarian counter-revolution, for Luther had sided with the nobility against the peasants who revolted against them and granted the state a certain semi-divinity. Only a few years earlier, in 1917, the German government tried to boost the war-weary public's fighting spirit with the 400th anniversary celebrations of Luther's 95 theses. 
Rather than making the Luther portrait play depth to the angel's surface, I want to try instead to show how Clay's compound work sets up ramifying comparisons and contrasts between the angel and the reformer. So this is going to take a lot of thinking about what these images meant when Clay put them together in Munich in 1920. So the Angelus reconfigures images seen as pivotal in conceptions of German art history and of world history that were contested in the aftermath of the Bavarian Revolution of 1918. So this was a period of violent struggle between left and right. The socialist premier had leaked documents to demonstrate German war guilt and was assassinated by an ultranationalist, leading to the establishment of the Munich Soviet Republic in the spring of 1919, which was bloodily suppressed shortly thereafter, prompting Clay himself to flee to Switzerland briefly. Clay's picture plays with old figures and images that were supercharged in this context. Now, others have already suggested that Clay's watercolor maybe riffs on Grunewald's 1515 Isenheim altarpiece, whose display in Munich in 1918 to 19 was a major event. They had to get the floors refinished afterwards. There are obvious, if not clinching, similarities between Clay's angel and Grunewald's Jesus, both glowing supernatural beings, hover in contraposto, arms outstretched, palms up. The angel's huge head can be read as referring to Grunewald's famous rainbow fireball, which is so radiant that it's hard to tell the uh, differentiation between the head and the halo. Quaitman's discovery makes this connection more compelling, I think. Now we can see that the representations with which Clay plays are of two of the historical watersheds most celebrated as such in early 20th century Germany. The idea of Christ as dividing history in the, into the eras of law and grace, and Luther's stand as initiating modernity, which began with the Reformation, according to 19th century German philosopher Hegel. These were seen as moments that opened a gulf between before and after. For many, being fully modern entailed placing oneself fully after these events. You can see how this would um, work in Imperial Germany, partly as a way of keeping um, Catholics and Jews um, out of the way, sort of not fully modern. Clay's work, I will argue, confounds the chronological logic of turning points that the images he compounds set forth. As one of Quaitman's paintings brings out really beautifully, the array of dates is both prominent and perplexing. You've got 1920, 1520 something in a print syntax that cannot possibly be 1520 something. And then you've got 1920 again. And by the way, that 32 is actually not a date. That's Clay's own system of entering uh, numbers sequentially into a catalog he kept of his work. So Clay's 1920 picture is intensely involved with images springing from around 400 years earlier. And what's really nice is that we actually um, have in Bern his complete library. Um, and so I was able to use books that he owned in order to understand how he might have seen these images. Um, so he owned Wilhelm Voringer's book on Cronach. The art historian Voringer, whose conception of abstraction was important for Clay, 
lauded Cranach's pre-Reformation Gothic work, as he called it, at the expense of his later Lutheran work. He also owned Wilhelm Hausenstein's 1919 book on the Isenheim altarpiece. Hausenstein, a left-wing Munich expressionist art critic, was actually one of Clay's own most important critical supporters. We can look more broadly, too. So in Munich in 1919, the sociologist Max Weber, a uh, writer about um, Protestantism and the capitalist um, work ethic, gave a lecture on politics as a vocation in which he used the famous Luther quotation on our engraving, here I stand, I can do no other, to exemplify the attitude of the human being who, he says, is capable of having a vocation for politics, which he contrasts with that of the politically active intellectuals in what he called the ongoing revolutionary carnival. The altarpiece, on the other hand, was seen as representing that which was believed lost with the Reformation that began just a couple years after it was made, the union of the religious and the sensuous that many saw as modernity's price. Hausenstein linked this altarpiece to the social radicalism, in part religiously inspired, that culminated in the great peasant revolt of 1524 to 1525, in contrast to Luther's siding with the powers that be. Long before the altarpiece came to Munich, it was a, a lodestone for artists and intellectuals. So Walter Benjamin actually had a reproduction of it hanging in his study in 1917. And its reception was very much bound up with nationalist cultural politics. Um, it was from Alsace, um, which was territory disputed between the French and the Germans. And so German nationalists saw this altarpiece as basically proof that Alsace was culturally German and belonged to Germany. It was during its stay in Munich, in the turbulent aftermath of Germany's defeat in the First World War, that the altarpiece reached the peak of its fame widely reproduced as a kind of ancestor of the contemporary expressionist art of that time as embodying the Gothic and the German. Some even saw it as taking on a new quasi-sacred role. So Hausenstein wrote that never before could people have made such a pilgrimage to an altar. It was like in the Middle Ages. After the mechanisms of more than four years of war, the masses gathered together for the first time before the spirit of a German artist. So these images were old, but they were by no means obscure allusions in Munich in 1920. Now, there are other works from around 1920 that deface old master reproductions. We can put Clay's alongside Duchamp's work on the Mona Lisa or Kurt Schwitter's renovation of Raphael's Sistine Madonna. But as himself a protagonist in 16th century debates about iconoclasm, it's difficult for Luther to play its innocent victim. Now his position was complex. While his opposition to what he saw as the church's idolatry encourage some to smash and, and burn images. He famously opposed iconoclasm. There he is, um, calming down this guy with the ax. Um, according to Luther, the crux was not the thing itself, but the beholder's attitude. So smashing things with an ax was not necessary. Luther portraits themselves, just to make things more complicated, were sometimes treated by his followers as quasi-cultic images. There were even miracle stories about them sweating. 
or like this one, surviving fires unsinged. So accordingly, some of Luther's orthodox enemies turned iconoclasts. See this picture of him with the mustache put on and the, the gouged eye. And another crucial difference. So Leonardo's and Raphael's paintings were then understood as supreme masterpieces of European art. Cronach's Luther's, not so much. Some of Cronach's work was widely admired, but the Luther portraits did not fit most critics' or artists' ideas about art. Muller's print after Cronach is demonstrably an icon of Protestantism, not of art. One of a series of prints he made of reformers, it does not try hard to deliver Cronach's style. It doesn't even refer to any particular painting. Now, the Cronach workshop developed a, a whole range of different Luther models, you could say, um, for different tastes. You had the pious young monk. You had the disguised outlaw, the humanist. The print is mostly based on the stout doctor type produced by the Cronach workshop from 1539 onwards, an older, plumper Luther in the academic gown in which he began preaching in 1524. It combines the type with the hands from the young monk line and Luther's words of 1521, which it seems determined the date. Such mixing and matching recalls Cronach's own mode of production. The replication and recombination of standardized types facilitated by the pouncing and tracing of linear faces and figures. Indeed, since Romanticism, there has been a narrative of the Protestant Reformation as the death of art. The story told usually went like this. The achievements of Durer and Grunewald, who established themselves on the eve of the Reformation, could not be built upon for the Reformation, even when it stopped short of actual iconoclasm, undermined the religious uses of art on which they ultimately depended. So according to Hegel, writing in the um, early 19th century, the need for inner spirituality drove the Reformation to pry religious ideas from their wrapping in the element of sense, the wrapping that was the job of painting in particular, returning them to what he calls the inwardness of heart and thinking. So therefore, Hegel notoriously claimed that art, considered in its highest vocation, is and remains for us a thing of the past. The Luther portrait that Clay used might be seen as referring to this death of art and exemplifying what images are like afterwards, instrumentalized, dull, and dry. So it follows that Clay's defacement may be far indeed from an anti-art gesture. Within the terms of German art discourse circa 1920, Putting a picture recalling Grunewald's resurrected Christ over a Luther portrait with Cronach's monogram would seem to announce pretty clearly something like the resurrection of art from the tomb in which Protestantism had laid it. In the book on Cronach that Clay owned, Voringer wrote, it requires only the name of one Matthias Grunewald to put the painter, Cronach, back in the place he deserves, one utters Grunewald's name in a memory, strong as a revelation, rises up, a storm of living color. Life, life, it cries out. So Clay layers Grunewald, as it were, over Cronach, or better, the, the modern artist's reinterpretation of the otherworldly image of Christ's transfigured body over the pedestrian reproductive print of Luther, an image that could be seen as representing both the historical circumstances 
that drove apart the religious and the sensuous and the ensuing degradation of the image. So the Angelus Novus seems almost like a kind of cryptic, riddling version of a frequent expressionist theme announcing modern art as re-enchantment, taking issue with Hegel's notorious end of art thesis, expressionists, such as Clay's friend Franz Marc, felt that a return to the inseparability of the religious and the sensuous was imminent. You can see one sort of version of this in um, Feininger's woodcut of a cathedral that accompanied the first circular announcing the program of the Bauhaus. You know, the, the vision of expressionist artists coming together to form something that would be like a cathedral in terms of unifying all of the arts and giving it a new kind of purpose. So in this reading, the Luther engraving acts something like a foil or a contrast, emphasizing the newness of Clay's new angel, which presents itself at the same time as a kind of return to a pre-Reformation regime of the image. Similarities allow the contrast to register. So actually, every visible element of the print along the edge can be contrasted with something in the clay. You've got the drapery, drapery, uh, tone, tone, monogram, signature, date, date. Um, Quaitman even suggests that the, the monogram, the CL, could be kind of a version of clay, if you misspell his name. And you can make even more connections. So Clay's angel is actually an oil transfer drawing. This is, this doesn't show up very well, but this is a pencil version. Um, what he did is he would create a pencil drawing, and then he would make using, um, he would take a sheet of paper, cover it with a tacky black paint or ink, and use it as kind of like a homemade carbon paper, basically, to transfer an image onto another surface. And this process of transferring linear images might be compared with the prints, in a way. The Cronach workshops tracing or pouncing for making large batches of Luther portraits, and more distantly engraving itself. And as I've said, Clay's angel even takes on some of the facial features of Luther, um, those jowls and untonsured curls that represent his opposition to asceticism, um, the kinds of practices he had to do as, as a monk. And then, of course, the, um, the eyes looking off to um, the edge of the, the paper as well. So in this reading, the point of these similarities is to bring out the differences, the distance between the modernist artist angel and the 19th century reproductive engraving of a kind of mashup of an old master's portraits. The angel positions itself as relatively direct, immediate, original, in comparison to the truly uncountable layers of mediation in the Luther portrait. This is reinforced by the dot and lozenge syntax of the engraving, which would have looked really fussy and fuddy-duddy in 1920. And the print's visible margins are all that you need to see that the logic of bodies is strikingly different between the two layers. Um, the angel is flat, transparent, and that's emphasized by the splayed outwardness of its Oran's gesture. And then we've got the involutions of Luther's drapery along the edge. Related to these differences is, of course, the sharp contrast between how the two layers were made. So there, there are a lot of angels in Clay's work. They might be seen as a kind of uh, riposte to Courbet's famous remark, show me an angel and I'll paint one. 
They are an ideal motif for Clay's understanding of art as that which, he says, does not reproduce the visible, but rather makes visible. The Luther engraving, on the other hand, suggests that it is based on a portrait based on Cranach's study of his fleshly sitter. Um, this is something that a um, painting that was actually in the Munich Art Gallery um, imagined. In his writing, Clay contrasted modern art with portraiture's traditional concern with likeness. So the angel plays modern and new against the old fashioned portrait engraving. As a comparison, let's bring in again Kurt Fitters's collage here, which updates the Sistine Madonna, giving the Virgin a chic new hat and a matching face, and almost obliterating the cherubs with a technical uh, image of a, a machine. So the bits of paper that Schwitters pastes over the reproduced masterpiece are themselves all products of reproductive technologies for printing words and images for a mass market. And so various links between modernity, fashion, mechanization, and disenchantment reinforce Schwitters's mockery. In contrast, the single piece of paper with which Clay covers over Luther, the Angelus, Novus as it is, also gestures towards a more distant past. It uses the Latin word for new. Given what lies beneath the angel, Clay's work also seems to seek to reanimate a kind of pre-Lutheran idea of communication. So, in this picture, Luther's mouth is closed and such direct angelic oral communication as seems to be pictured here is displaced by the written scripture that he holds. The idea that the Reformation marked the beginning of an era of dominance of the written word in the printed book inaugurated by the huge success of Luther's translation of the Bible and the Protestant doctrine by scripture alone was widespread circa 1920. Walter Benjamin, among others, wrote about this. And it was particularly vivid because this was a moment when many saw new media technologies like film and the gramophone as marking its end. So in the Angelus, the textuality, the, the writtenness of the old book, it seems, contrasts with the direct oral communication of the new and yet still older angel. And the angel comes out on top. So there's a lot of evidence for, for this reading. Um, Tease, teasing it out of the sort of art discourse of the time, the way that people in Munich in 1920 were thinking about art. Um, there's a lot of evidence for this idea of the new angel as the new art, as the resurrection of art, re-enchanted and immediate. You could actually see Clay as taking up Hausenstein's words of just the previous year. And the book that Clay owned about the relationship between the Isenheim altarpiece and contemporary art. So Hausenstein wrote, our speculative graphic art will only be fruitful if it is a prolegomenon to future altarpieces, if it is somehow leading to future altarpieces. And Hausenstein is really aiming these words very directly at clay. He was writing elsewhere around the same time about Clay as the most important contemporary practitioner of what he called speculative graphic art. So is Clay affirming here that his art is fruitful in Hausenstein's terms, a prolegomenon to future altarpieces? But the tone of Clay's work doesn't quite fit. The small scale work 
the snaggle-toothed homunculus of an angel gestures towards and undermines such an aspiration. There were plenty of artists who tried in various and complex ways to fulfill versions of it, but I don't think Clay can be counted among them. The tone of Clay's work is far more ambivalent. If Clay's angel mimics Grunewald's Christ, he seems to do so mockingly, rendering the blinding radiance of the halo around Jesus' head as the oversized noggin of a caricature. Much of Clay's art at this time took on expressionist ideas to parody them. The Angelus might be seen as such a parody of the expressionist vision of modernism as the resurrection of the Gothic. Clay's use of color should also be considered. As we saw in Voringer, Grunewald was understandably widely considered to be one of the great colorists. And his handling of light and color in the resurrection panel in particular was the focus of much, much attention. You know, you've got in the early 20th century so many beautiful descriptions of how this prismatic color is bursting out of the black night, illuminating the atmosphere and the shroud unfurling around him. Clay often favored brilliant color, but the Angelus Novus is rendered mostly in shades of brown and yellow that suggest even an artificial aging of his paper. As he does in a number of works of the 1920s, here Clay conjures paradoxical, impossible temporalities by combining simulated traces of age with stylistic markers of the modern. So Clay's Angelus Novus both gestures towards and undermines a vision of the new art, including his own, as a new angel announcing a resurrection of art that would make it no longer a thing of the past. An ambivalent icon, it hovers rather than taking a stand like Luther, enacting and deflating hope such as Hausenstein's of a turning point ahead. Clay's angel calls into question the logic of turning points. Echoed in the millenarian anticipations of expressionists such as Hausenstein. The images of Christ and Luther at compounds are of celebrated watersheds understood to have cleaved history irrevocably into before and after. But each of these images is in Clay's work marked by emphatic temporal dispersal and disjunctions of style, motif, date, apparent condition. So it's the reformer as he looked in portraits of 1539 onwards in a print of 1838 dated 1521. And the age brown angel called new in a dead language dated 1920 mimicking a figure painted in 1515 that was understood as having reached a kind of zenith of its contemporaneity in 1918, 1919. Layered together, we have a paradoxical compound that both makes much of and confounds chronology, neither timeless nor aligned neatly with a moment of fabrication. Rather, it is in too many times so maybe it's fitting then that Clay's picture has become best known not at all along the lines that I have proposed here in my attempt to excavate what this image would have meant when it was made, but rather by later becoming, long after it left Clay's hands, the model for the appearance of Benjamin's angel of history. I'd love to. Yeah, it was. He had a big, um, like his first big um, 
exhibition, uh, kind of mid-career retrospective um, at Hans Goltz's gallery in Munich in 1920, and it was exhibited there. So it actually had like a brief public life um, before Benjamin bought it the next year in 1921 and kept it in his study and wrote about it. And you know, it was in private hands from 1921 until um, it entered the collection of the uh, Israel Museum in Jerusalem in the 1980s from Gershwang Sholem's house. So uh, first of all, thank you. Unpacking all of this is going to take a few minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Nonetheless, as I happen to own a Bauhaus artist studio, which I've rebuilt on my property, wow. and so I've studied the Bauhaus a little. To quote an incorrect quote from Freud, Sometimes a cigar is just a cigar, uh -huh. <laughs> which he never said, but he was a cigar smoker. And given the economic situation Clay sort of moved through, which was sort of poverty, lower middle class poverty, and reusing a previous artist's material from Michelangelo all the way up to um, Rothko is not unusual. Right. Is there much ado about coincidence? Yeah, so this was a lot of the um, sort of back and forth between R.H. Quaitman and the Paper Conservation Department at the Israel Museum. Um, so here's the thing. Yes, Clay used old prints frequently, just as like cheap, pretty good paper. Um, However, so there's actually, there have been a number of um, works on paper of his that have been you know, damaged or had to be remounted or one thing or another. And then people are like, oh my goodness, there's a print under it. But this is different because he, he could have, if he were just being thrifty, and he was a thrifty guy for sure, um, he could have, you know, we've got three pieces of paper here. We've got the cardboard mount, the engraving, and then a piece of encre paper here that he used for the watercolor. Um, to be thrifty, you could have used the engraving, you know, its backside for, for another work. So there's something else going on here. Um, it is, I mean, it's interesting to think about, like, why this hasn't been seen. That's one of the sort of very oddest and most inexplicable parts of this. The thing is, is Clay did often put a dark border around his works on paper, um, usually just ink or watercolor directly on the, the cardboard mount. Um, and in reproductions, this tends to look just like, oh, it's one of Clay's dark borders. But when you're looking at it in person, it's, and this is one of the things that's hardest to convey about it. I wish I, like, it would be very terrible for the work itself because it's quite fragile. Um, but I wish I could bring it and, like, show it to you because when you are looking at it in person in good light, you are immediately like, what's that? So I think it's a, a, he's thrifty, but there's like a, a tease going on here. I just wonder, this was such a superb art, piece of art history. Does this make you want to go back and reassess other images that you've worked on? Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, to me, one of the um, one of the lessons in this is that even works that I mean, I feel like I never really looked at this image because I felt like I already knew it, and I think that so often your familiarity with things blinds you to them. I mean, one of the things that was really remarkable is once Quaitman told me about this, I started, of course looking through all the reproductions I had of this work. 
And the best reproduction I had, where you could really see everything that she was talking about, was in a college textbook called Art Since 1900 that I had used to teach survey classes. And you could see my notes on the opposite page. I could have, if I had looked, I could have been like, holy moly, what is, I wouldn't have needed Rebecca Quaitman to tell me about it. But familiarity breeds blindness. And you know, sometimes people are like, oh my goodness, I can't believe you're working on European early 20th century art. Hasn't that been studied to death? But to me, this is a reminder that if you are looking closely, you are going to see things that have not been seen before. Um, you used the word resurrection a couple times. Uh, first time, resurrection of the art, which referred to the Angelus Novus, like from complex, like Madonna Mona Lisa paintings to simplified ones, like uh, Angelus Novus. And another one was resurrection of Gothic. And I'm a little bit disagree with you because Gothic usually is architectural style and usually associates with religion, you know, Catholic religion. I understand that the buildings are tall, but it was like a purpose in medieval ages in the cities to make it tall so everyone would see them and go like every Sunday, for example. So would you mind to clarify why you believe that um, Folkley's these paintings is resurrection of Gothic? Yeah, so um, there's... I mean, I'm partly just sort of like moving into the sort of the rhetoric and the language of the images that he's using and the way that they were spoken of at this time. Um, you know, this image of the the resurrection of um, of Christ from the tomb um, is something that um, was, um, you know, th there's a way in which sort of ideas about religion and ideas about art when you're talking about medieval art become very deeply enmeshed with each other. And you see in a lot of expressionist art discourse the idea that like maybe we are on the brink of a kind of new era of spirituality and of art that will lead to a reintegration of art and society such as was believed to obtain in the Christian Middle Ages, which became um, a kind of model of what art could could mean socially, and that many expressionists thought, like maybe maybe we are on the brink of something like that again. Does that um, answer your your question? Did somebody else have another question? Oh. You've done a beautiful job about connecting this painting to the past. Um, I have to tell you, uh, what it reminded me of is uh, the movie Homeland, or the series Homeland. Have you seen the image of, of Carrie's as it opens up? That's what it reminded me of, the bear. Well, it looks like a bear, but it's the angel going forward. So I was just curious how this painting, did it inspire anything going forward. Yeah. Um, so unfortunately, I don't, I don't know Homeland. Uh, homeland? Oh, God, I'm sorry. I'll look it up in my, um, I have internet. <laughs> um, uh, oh, my goodness. It, it was out about 10 years, it's been out about 10 years ago. And is, yeah, it takes place in, um, she's a CIA agent. But in, in the, in, someone know what I'm talking about? 
in the entry to it, there is, yes, there is like the, this opening. And I, when I looked at the picture, that's what it reminded me of. This, the, the Angelus Novus yes. here? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's become, um, you know, it, it, it has certainly influenced a lot of, um, a lot of image making. I mean, it has, you know, I mean, it, it, it is this meme um, in a way. It's gone, um, it's gone viral. It's instantly recognizable. Um, you see it in all these funny contexts. Take a look at Homeland. See? I will. <laughs> Anyway, that's yeah. my association. It's beautiful. I mean, one of the, the things that's fun about doing this kind of work is like teasing out these sort of conversations between images that are taking place, whether you're you know, aware of it or not. <laughs> I, don't, I don't need the microphone. That's true. You don't need any microphone. <laughs> <laughs> so early on, you talked about Benjamin taking this and making it a symbol for the left. You said that a few times. Yeah. I don't get what that means or how that connects. This yeah. So, criticism of the 20s. So it's not really, that wasn't really what Benjamin did. It was more what his interpreters did in the 1960s and 1970s. So it's, it's like, a, you know, many, many layers of reception. Um, it, I mean, it did figure into, um, into Benjamin's writings about, um, where in his um, theses on the concept of history, he brings together Marxist ideas and theological ideas, both from Judaism and Christianity, in this very strange and idiosyncratic mix. Um, and as Benjamin, I mean, many of Benjamin's writings at the time, like, no one, no one read them, um, or you know, he sent them to a few friends. But in the 1960s, there was a huge sort of recovery of his critical legacy, and as part of that, the Angelus Novus assumed its sort of contemporary um, ubiquity, um, partly. Partly because it became a sort of disputed territory between Gershom Sholem, one of his best friends, who was a historian of Jewish mysticism, and who felt that many of Benjamin's sort of leftist interpreters were neglecting that side of his work. Um, so it became a kind of battleground between different interpretations of Benjamin. So I, I just had one, I, that was a brilliant lecture. Thank you so much for sharing it with us, and I hope that many of us will buy the book. But you know, one thing I did want to say in answer to your skepticism about whether or not this is an over-interpretation of an object and whether or not it could just be the coincidence of reusing a support to make another work of art, it, you know, in terms of the mode of symbolism in which this is still sort of participating, I mean, the practice of embedding images deliberately and overlaying them uh, as if a palimpsest is already an established mode of modernism, and it is an echo to some extent of the Freudian version of excavating mm -hmm. that which is unconscious and unseen and that it should be sensed, sensible, even if you can't directly sense it. And you know that's something that's even in the early work of Picasso in the Blue Period. So it's actually quite consistent with an established belief in some senses of the evocative power of the image and the intent, therefore, for its discovery is pretty, I think, convincing in that regard. Thank you. So just, but anyway, thank you so much for your attention and please come back uh, for our next Art Matters lecture.